Hello, everybody. Peter Maravellis here. I hope this finds you all safe and well. Tonight, City Lights and Yes Media present the book launch for the book titled The Path to a Livable Future, A New Politics to Fight Climate Change, Racism, and the Next Pandemic. It is authored by Stan Cox and published by City Lights Books. As many of you know, City Lights is a publisher as well as a bookstore, so it becomes an especially auspicious occasion when we can celebrate the launch of a book that actually carries our own imprint and to be partnering up with our friends at the wonderful Yes Magazine. So Yes is a nonprofit independent publisher which seeks to inspire people to build a more just, sustainable and compassionate world. I'd like to remind everyone that we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ramatish Ohlone peoples from where our City Lights continues to celebrate virtually the works of authors we know and love with readings, discussions, and forums until we are able to meet again in person. So we are delighted to have with us tonight Stan Cox, the author of The Path to a Livable Future. Stan Cox began his career in the U.S. Department of Agriculture and is now the lead scientist at the Land Institute. He's the author of the books The Green New Deal and Beyond, uh, also published by City Lights. The book, Any Way You Slice It, The Past, Present, and Future of Rationing. Uh, the book, Losing Our Cool, and Sick Planet, Corporate Food and Medicine. His writing about the economic and political roots of the global ecological crisis has appeared in such places as the New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, The Guardian UK, Al Jazeera, Descent Magazine, as well as local publications spanning 43 states. The Atlantic Monthly named Mr. Cox as their Reader's Choice Brave Thinker. He makes his home in Salina, Kansas. Joining him in conversation will be Sonali Kohatkar. She is the racial justice editor for Yes Magazine. Well, without much more ado, please join us in welcoming Stan Cox and Sonali Kohatkar. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all. Uh, welcome to all of you. It's so strange to, you know, still so long into the pandemic strange to be doing these events virtually and sitting in our own little tiny remote spaces talking to one another. Uh, I do miss the days when we can all sort of be in a room together and feel that energy, but hopefully we can try to recreate some of that here today. Um, I'm so excited to be uh, in conversation with Stan today. Uh, his book is such an important uh, synthesis of so many of our myriad problems that we face today. But what's really exciting is that it offers a path forward. And Stan, I want to um, start by quoting you to you and asking you to expand on this quote that jumped out at me as I was reading your book. In the introduction to your book, you say that 400 years of white settler colonialism and the failure to pay heed to indigenous black and Latino examples of a better way have created the calamities we now face including ecological destabilization, end of quote. There was a time when five, 10 years ago, the issues of racial justice were really sort of pushed aside as not as important as ecological disaster and climate change. And you and others are now making that explicit connection that racial justice is a path toward climate justice. So expand on that quote how it was 400 years of white settler colonialism that you feel created the calamities, this universe of calamities we now face. Yes, that um, um, when if you look at um, when um, the, um, you know, when Europeans came to this continent, first of all, um, you know, 95% of the indigenous population died. Um, then the, uh, as Europeans moved across the continent, the first thing uh, that, um, that they did was to take millions of year old uh, prairie that the, that the indigenous inhabitants had um, thrived uh, on, um, you know, they had cared for both the forest and the prairies, um, and, um, and, and the trees were cut down, the prairies were plowed up and planted to uh, European crops. This um, you know, resulted in the 
um, you know, all of the plagues of agriculture that we have today, um, soil erosion, water pollution, loss of uh, biodiversity, et cetera. Um, but um, you know, we, we didn't stop there. Um, the, uh, you know, the uh, in, indigenous um, uh, people who were still here, and it turned out they were living on land. They had you know, kind of retreated to lands that um, overlay um, most of the fossil fuel resources. And so we, you know, once again, um, we um, ended up with, um, with uh, exploitation of both um, um, resources in the earth and, and uh, human beings. And um, it, you know, it kind of came to a head um, you know, five, six years ago with the, the uh, pipeline struggles and so forth and in, in, in indigenous people have been in kind of the forefront um, in the, um, in, in, in these, um, in these struggles. So I remember in 2016, of course, we saw a peak, one, one of the first peaks of those indigenous led struggles in the Standing Rock, yeah. um, the, the movements uh, against the Dakota Access Pipeline, the water protectors, and then 2020 seemed like the next upheaval. It's interesting, every four years we've seen this, yeah. and you, your first chapter is called, of your book is called The Cruelest Year. Yeah. Um, and and this, there's this triad of issues that you continually center in your book, the racial, economic, and environmental injustices that are all sort of woven together in various ways. How did <clears throat> that triad of issues emerge in the cruelest year, in 2020, <clears throat> when we were struck by the pandemic? Well, it was looking like in uh, in the spring of 2020, when we were all kind of in shock and figuring out what to do, I think uh, I naively and, and I think others thought, okay, this is going to open up the, the eyes of Americans to, to the, the fact that we, that we can't um, you know, consume as much as we want. We can't um, continue to um, uh, exploit labor because you know, we're now suddenly we're totally dependent on uh, people working in in the in the food industry and in healthcare and so forth who um, we've you know, uh, kind of ignored and and uh, exploited for a long time and now our lives are in, in their hands and and we have to. Um, distinguish between um, uh, essential production of, of basic goods and, um, and, and keep uh, resources going into those areas. And if um, goods and services are not essential, pay people um, to stay home like as, as other countries did. Um, uh, unfortunately, we, our country uh, failed pretty miserably in all of those things. We, you know, we, we, uh, there was a lot of um, sentiment expressed for healthcare workers and so forth, but in general, we didn't. Uh, we, we, on both um, economic and um, you know, racial ethnic justice um, issues, we um, uh, totally failed, and you know, uh, black and Latino indigenous communities um, suffered uh, suffered the worst. Um, the uh, um, life expectancy of uh, the white population in uh, during the year of 2020 declined by nine months. Uh, the Latino community two years, the black community three years and, and, and that, you know, that was uh, not, not a coincidence that that, that, that happened. Um, and, um, and it was also the year of the uprisings, the Black Lives Matter yeah, uprisings yeah. that were so multiracial. Yeah, yeah. And so, 
yeah, just as the that <clears throat> um, first um, peak of the of the virus was cresting, then you know, then we had George Floyd uh, being murdered, and then for for months we had um, you know, the, probably the most in, inspiring thing of the whole year, and something that once again I was looking at that and saying. Um, here, here we have in Little Salina, Kansas, in the middle of you know, one of the reddest states, um, we, we had the biggest um, street demonstration in March that, that we've ever seen here. Um, you know, the folks were, who were here in the 60s said, yeah, it was bigger than during Vietnam or anything. It was people of all colors and, and backgrounds out there and, uh, <clears throat> and and so those months of this uh, uprising um, haven't gone away it's not you know it's not in the headlines every day but I, I, I think that that is one of the uh, one, one of the things that really uh, it, it can it, it inspires us and uh, in, in what I'm saying in the book is that uh, both the, uh, the uh, movement that is kind of characterized as Black Lives Matter and the climate movement and movements for um, healing our um, broken uh, public health system and our fragile food system, uh, we, we all need to converge because they, they really are the same problem. Um, and that's a really good segue to the fact that we're at a point today where we're seeing inflation is rising and our global economy, which is so spread out and so dependent on fossil fuels um, is, you know, <laughs> being subject yeah. to delays. Uh, you know, people can't get some of the goods they want. There are products that are held up on, yeah. on, on, freight ships. Um, mm -hmm. In your second chapter, the tangled roots of our predicaments, one of the things that you take on is this, the food system that we depend on. And we started out, you started out explaining how our sort of agricultural uh, industrialization set the stage for so many of the issues that we face today. And then during the pandemic, we saw food workers, uh, every aspect of the food chain be deemed essential but that ended up being an excuse to exploit them even further and really expose how broken our food system is. But so much depends on our food system, right? I mean, our climate crisis, right. inequities. So if, I'm wondering if you can delve into <laughs> that, that aspect of it. Um, right. <clears throat> um, they, in, in, if you think back to um, you know, early in 2020, what some of the worst outbreaks were occurring in uh, meat packing facilities, which were an, an ideal um, incubator for the virus because the, you know, the virus likes a cold, dry conditions and a lot of people in, in congested uh, areas. And um, it, you know, it, it just tore through uh, here in, in the uh, plains in the Midwest, it really, uh, tore through, but then in the um, in, in the West, in California, in the Pacific Northwest, Yakima Valley, and in, in Washington, um, it, it you know, did the same thing in um, uh, vegetable fruit processing facilities, other um, uh, other other facilities, and. Uh, also, um, farm laborers out in, in the open air where, um, you know, the, the virus isn't that bad, but um, when, when, um, the, uh, when the workforce are kind of crammed into uh, buses to go back and forth to the farms, or they um, are, are living in a very, uh, uh, cramped uh, uh, multi-generational um, housing with you know, in, in trailers and so forth. Uh, there was a you know, you know, terrible spread of, of the virus there and the, uh, the farm owners 
were of no help at all. They were um, uh, offering masks to the um, to the workers only on days when they knew the federal inspectors were coming by. Um, there was a, a, a tomato farm in Virginia that um, decided, okay, we, um, we're, we're gonna keep our people safe, but we're going to do it by uh, basically keeping them in, uh, in uh, uh, slave quarters. They, they were confined to the farm. They couldn't leave the farm for uh, any reason. They, um, you know, they, they would ship in some uh, food for them, but they, they were um, in, in uh, terrible shape. So that the, the food system uh, completely, uh, completely broke down. Right. So uh, the next chapter of your book, chapter three, is called a to-do list for the 2020s. Um, mm -hmm. And and I, I love that title, by the way. And, and so just mm -hmm. as we uh, see this triad of interconnected problems, mm -hmm. systemic problems that we face, racism, economic injustice, e mm -hmm. environmental disaster, how is the path out of these crises also necessarily a multi-pronged approach that has to tackle all three? Because we've often in the past made the mistake of trying to prioritize, well, these struggles have to wait because this one is the most important. And that's been problematic and has often no. come back to sort of, you know, uh, haunt mm -hmm. uh, our, our movements. No. So, so what, how does the to-do list take on all three issues, which you make the case very effectively is a necessity if we are to climb out of any one of them. Well, um, it, the, at the root of all of, of these crises is the, the prioritization of um, production for profit and not for meeting people's uh, essential needs. And so we're, um, you know, we're, we're always told we, we have to maintain growth, uh, economic growth, uh, GDP growth at uh, 3% or something, and, or things are uh, going to go south. Um, the, the reason for that is that um, the, the people at the top of the economic pyramid who are getting most of the pie they don't want to give up their share. So they, they want the pie to keep growing in, in order to um, accommodate, you know, you know, keep the rest of us alive and, and you know, um, you know, to um, not, you know, to all have, or to avoid having uh, everybody get a more equal share because you know, it, inequality has been uh, getting worse uh, for a long time, and 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 so um, so with climate, for example, the reason that we have not seen the the very thing that has to happen before we get control of uh, the climate emergency at all, um, which is to drive the extraction and use of fossil fuels down to zero as soon as possible. The reason that hasn't happened in the US or any of the affluent countries is that it would um, definitely have a, a serious effect on uh, growth and in fact would uh, probably uh, reverse growth. But the, um, you know, doing that and uh, moving into a society that prioritizes uh, producing um, essential goods and services and meeting human needs and leaving aside uh, you know, production of, uh, of uh, yachts and so forth um, would actually create a much better society. There's plenty uh, to go around, but because um, the, the, um, the, the inequities of 
uh, of production and consumption have become so sharp where, um, you know, as we all saw uh, so far during the pandemic, the 600 richest people in the US uh, grew their wealth by a, a trillion dollars or something. And, uh, and the, you know, the rest of society took hard economic hits. Um, you, you, that kind of society can't uh, you know, can't go on, and so we're uh, you know, we we really have to stop prioritizing the aggregate growth of the economy and start prioritizing um, uh, fair sharing and um, in, um, equity. You, you were mentioning earlier how there were other countries during the pandemic that paid people to stay at home because it was a national, international emergency yeah. and that needed to be done. Here in the US, yeah. we obviously didn't do that. But one of the things that we did do was that we ensured that uh, vaccines were available for free. And uh, even the cost of testing is covered by the government. We were able to sort of nationalize a small piece of our healthcare system yes. in order to meet this emergency. And so similarly, you talk in your book, which I thought was a, a sort of one of the more radical um, approaches to the climate emergency, that we need to start talking about nationalizing the fossil fuel industry. And you write nationalization will be necessary because fossil fuel industry executives knowing full well the role their pr products have played in triggering catastrophic warming of the earth continue to deceive the public while pumping mining processing and selling fuels at handsome profits and these companies are committed to their this course of action they couldn't even cease or desist if they wanted to right now yeah. as we're all speaking there's a major climate conference taking place in glasgow scotland yeah. and the fossil fuel profiteers are at the table trying to get in on the net zero tech um, yeah. a, a revolution, if you will, and trying to get all the subsidies. So we'll talk, talk more about the nationalization mm. of the fossil fuel industry. Because mm. of course the Republicans and the conservatives would say, oh, you socialist, you are, <laughs> you know, you're, you're the path to authoritarianism, et cetera. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, actually uh, nationalization is uh, almost as uh, American as uh, apple pie. We during every war that um, for the past 80 years, during every war, the government uh, has had to take over um, industries uh, because um, you know, certain, you know, certain goods needed to be produced and, and they you know, weren't being produced. In the 1980s, because of the uh, scandals and corruption in the savings and loan industry, a thousand institutions were um, taken over by the government. And it's, it's estimated that um, the cost of you know, totally buying out the fossil fuel industry and all of its reserves would just be in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And, and now we're um, you know, seeing a trillion dollar bills being uh, debated in, in Congress uh, repeatedly now. So that, and, but um, I would say that the buyout should not go to uh, pay off the uh, stockholders of the fossil fuel industry, but uh, to uh, 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 pay the workers or, or to uh, get, you know, get the uh, employees of those industries into um, you know, uh, better situations and get them out of the uh, uh, fossil fuel industry and just um, uh, shut down, not, not immediately, but to um, uh, gradually phase out fossil fuels, not, not so gradually, like within uh, 15 years, but in both uh, the Green New Deal and beyond uh, published last year and then the path to a livable future this year. My uh, central argument on, on climate is that there needs to be um, a statutory cap on the number of barrels of oil, cubic feet of gas, and tons of coal 
that are allowed out of the ground and into the economy or, and, or allowed through the ports of entry um, you know, every year. And that, that needs to be ratcheted down uh, uh, very quickly. And based on the um, UN's emissions gap reports and, and so forth, that it needs to be ratcheted down at a, a rate of uh, 8% a year, which is uh, unprecedented. And it, it, it would be um, uh, uh, historically unprecedented, but uh, that's um, what, uh, what we would have to do. Um, and okay, so what would that trigger? It would mean that um, as happened in World War II and, and other, other times that um, we, we have a whole uh, portion of the economy walled off you know, in, in the case of World War II for war production. In this case, because we're voluntarily leaving those resources in the ground, and we have to, uh, you know, led by the government, but uh, locally administered, we would have to ensure that um, resources go to uh, production that meets human needs and, and not to waste, waste or superfluous production. Um, and then for um, the consumer economy, um, say the, uh, the at the gas station or utility bill that um, everyone would need to be assured of a fair share of um, electricity uh, and gas, et cetera, uh, which uh, would mean, first of all, that it would have to be price controlled and then that um, fair shares rationing, uh, like we had during World War II, would uh, would be necessary. And, and there have been uh, um, systems worked out for doing this. There were uh, 10 years ago in the UK, uh, this kind of thing was being debated in, in Parliament. Uh, but um, that that's, we're not going to, um, uh, avert the climate emergency by um, simply building a lot more solar and wind farms, and we're not going to do it with uh, a carbon tax. It, some of that stuff, if it were 1990, we, it would be, um, you know, it, it, it might be a good way to get there, but time has run out now. And um, we, we've got to have a direct way of uh, keeping fossil fuels in the ground. I mean, right now at the COP26, there is this entire focus of that global meeting is on net zero emissions. That's a Biden administration yeah. centerpiece. And to do that, they are touting emerging technologies that don't even exist yet. These sort of fantasies yeah. such as carbon capture, cloud seeding, and at stake are trillions of dollars in financing and funding that the same companies who help create the problem are chomping at the bit to get a piece of. The world's largest asset manager uh, management fund, BlackRock, is supporting net yeah. zero for this very reason. And um, these are all fantastical approaches to solving climate change but the idea of just phasing out fossil fuels, which is addressing the root core of the problem mm. is, you know, it's barely just now made it, I understand, into the draft of a, an agreement that's being floated out, but everyone expects that language to be watered down over the next yeah. four or five days. So what you're suggesting is government regulation, strong government regulation at a time when we've been convinced through a very effective decades long propaganda campaign that government is the problem, not the solution. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we end up relying on political parties to get us there. And so we try to bring Democrats into, the, into power to stave off fascist white supremacist takeovers of our country, but Democrats never go far enough. And so people end up feeling powerless. And this is our conundrum that I feel like so many of these talks end up at that we end up feeling powerless right yeah yeah we really are in a, a 
predicament with, with that because um, you know we we are dealing with this um, recalcitrant uh, segment of our population, and we're kind of, kind of having to you know, fend that off while, while at the same time um, uh, calling for uh, the government to um, you know go way beyond what the uh, FDR administration uh, did, which it was probably the previous, um, the, the, the most profound intervention of the uh, federal government in, in the economy uh, before now. And it's uh, you know, what the, um, the Democrats are proposing is, is all good. The, um, I guess the, the New Deal part of what they're proposing is great. The green part is uh, it's very weak. Um, uh, where there, there are proposals, there's a proposal for, for example, the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, which would be modeled on the old uh, uh, and still existing nuclear non-proliferation treaty to um, which would be a kind of a global version of what I'm uh, talking about for the uh, for the US and um, we um, you know, it, it, that's kind of a, a dream because how, how are you going to get I think there are 139 nations that signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, where, um, yeah, but some, you know, somebody's got to lead the way. I don't think um, all the big emitters are going to hold hands and jump into the pool together. But if a few, if a few do, and especially uh, in the U.S. Uh, above all of them, um, if you know, if we did that. Um, then you know, we we could um, lead the way. It's uh, you know, it's um, highly unlikely, but I think we, what the uh, the leaders of the climate movement sh must not do is to say, okay, we're going to go and you know, you know, we're we're, we're going to build a, a, a bunch of a, a, a high speed trains and electric cars and a, and, and a smart grid and that'll take it take care of the problem they we, we need to say if we're really going to get control of this this is how far we've got to go and yeah we can you know be much more gradual and say okay well we'll get to that point in you know, by 2050 or whatever but we have to recognize that by doing that, we're accepting uh, you know, several more degrees of warming and, and that's going to be uh, catastrophic. So I, I don't think we, need, we, we should uh, spoon feed uh, this. Um, in a few minutes, we'll get to audience questions, but uh, I think the leaders of the climate movement are much smarter than, uh, I think most political leaders realize, especially today, given that there has been such a transformation of leadership into indigenous hands just in the last like five years or so. Yeah. And it's been remarkable. So we're seeing yeah. um, indigenous led movements, climate justice movements on the ground, making very clear that indigenous stewardship of the land, which isn't to treat nature as a separate cut off thing from humanity, but learning how to live in harmony and symbiosis with it is the way forward. And I wanna sort of pick up on what I was saying earlier about the sense of powerlessness. While there is a sense of powerlessness because we face all of these problems together and see them as a whole, there's a lot of grassroots um, movements that are actually doing it remarkable work, right? Like the indigenous led land back movement and demanding that, um, that, that land be returned into indigenous land, hands. And of course, all of these things will take a lot longer than we have time. Uh, but we also sometimes, don't we lose sight of the impact that m grassroots movements have on politicians? For example, if 
civil society wasn't present at these COP meetings, you wouldn't even have the idea of phasing out fossil fuels, enter a draft. You know, it would, it would, have, it would have gone the other way. We sometimes lose sight of the victories that we do enjoy, right? I mean, it's not yeah. all doom and gloom. <laughs> oh, yes. They, yeah. Since the uh, summer of 2020, the next most uh, ex inspiring thing that I seen was this past weekend went there with those uh, 100,000 or so uh, folks in the streets of uh, Glasgow and there was the the um, uh, the day when it was all young people and there was a day led by uh, indigenous people and and they're they're holding uh, those folks uh, feet to the fire and, and then there was the group photo of the delegates to COP and it was a whole bunch of male business suits you you, you could heart there there were like you could spot four or five uh, women or yeah, they, these were the world leaders who were there talking there were just uh, a few women but outside it was um it, it it's uh, been great and i think going back to what you were talking about with uh, all this carbon removal business. This is where um, the, the world's um, indigenous people and just um, uh, people, uh, rural people around the world are really uh, rising up and, and saying, you're not going to plant um, you know, billions of uh, hectares of land to uh, some energy crops when 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 we you know, you know, those uh, lands are needed to produce food and, and that's that's you know, basically what we're doing we're wanting to in in the affluent uh, in the global north we're wanting to keep you know, burning uh, uh, coal and natural gas and oil um, to um, in and the way to do that is to um, have the uh, the plants and in, in the soil of the global south uh, be absorbing it, and it's uh, it, it's just it, it can't happen, and, and it's uh, it's going to be a catastrophe if it does. And then the other the uh, industrial means of sucking carbon dioxide out of the uh, atmosphere, the, these uh, net zero or um, uh, ne negative uh, emission technologies are um, uh, even, um, uh, they're going to impact uh, people in the global north uh, as well. It's estimated, um, not, not, let's see, it was in uh, February of 2020 in Mississippi, this uh, CO2 pipeline, we, we actually have pipelines carrying carbon dioxide or, around the country, which uh, are mainly used to inject the CO2 into the ground to push more oil out so we can burn it in vehicles to put more CO2 in the air. But this pipeline burst and wreaked havoc on this uh, uh, Sataria, Mississippi, I think was the name of the town, but there were you know, 50 people hospitalized with horrible symptoms that, uh, that lasted months. And, and we have like 1500 miles of these CO2 pipelines now, but they're saying that you know, if we have a you know, this uh, full um, carbon removal economy where we're burning fossil fuels and then bringing them back in that we will require in this country as many miles of pipeline for carrying CO2 as we now have for carrying gas and oil, which is uh, uh, millions of miles of uh, pipelines. And it's, it's just uh, technology gone insane. Let's uh, let's go to some audience questions. Stan, mm -hmm. we've had some uh, active chats. Um, I want to start up at, or earlier. 
Um, I'll just have to pick and choose a few because we don't have enough time to get to everyone's questions. But uh, Margaret Stewart was mentioning China's current hybrid approach to nationalization and privatization of energy sources. She asks, is the flexibility they're showing helping them through the current energy crisis as well as the climate crisis, or is it creating other problems? Uh, China is the world's biggest uh, greenhouse gas emitter, right? <laughs> right, yeah, yeah they're, the, the biggest um, annual emitter, um, we, we have a lot more historic emissions, but they are right. currently uh, emitting more. And, and they also are not uh, very successfully reducing their uh, burning of coal. They're you know, one, one of the uh, bigger coal burners. And, uh, I don't know, they talk a good game uh, about the ecological civilization and, and so forth, but um, I, I don't see them uh, because they're you know, basically working on the same uh, you know, profit and growth model that we're working on. And um, I, I, don't, I don't have a lot of hope that China will, I, I think, um, I, I don't know, um, um, you know the, the Biden administration keeps talking about you know, all this um, infrastructure and climate stuff are going to do, it's going to make us more competitive. And, and that's kind of an uh, oxymoron. You know, if we're competing with China, we're each trying to uh, you know, get the leg up on the other one, which means we we need to burn more energy and 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 so forth. So I'm uh, I, I think we can uh, help with this by saying we're going first. We're you know we're not you know, our main goal is not to um, to make more money off of trade with you, it, uh, our, our main goal is to satisfy all of our needs with, uh, you know, with, with the uh, minimum emissions, then uh, you know, maybe China won't feel so pressured to do what they're doing. Right. Um, Ruth Newman asks, I'd like to know why the fossil fuel industry isn't being charged for all the damage and death they've caused. Why is the government, i.e. taxpayers, spending money to rescue people and economies when it's entirely the fault of the fossil fuel industry? Wouldn't that be enough to close them down if they had to pay the actual price for all their global destruction? <laughs> and that's a really good question. I mean, if you think about like tobacco uh, yeah. companies, right, who were forced to pay for advertising yeah. against tobacco, mm. forced to pay for damages to people who suffered the ill effects of tobacco. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and we're, we're not only um, uh, allowing them to do this with no penalty, um, the government is still subsidizing the uh, extraction of uh, fossil fuels. Um, and, and this is another reason, I, I think rather than um, you know, using uh, carbon taxes or fining or, or, or you know, bringing suit lawsuits against the fossil fuel companies like we did um, you know, with the tobacco companies, you know, it, it just take them over. And if they, uh, if they um, you know, make claims, okay, we have to be paid fair market value for the, our uh, oil and gas reserves that are, that are in the ground, if, if the government says, well, actually, we, you know, we've got legislation that is going to keep those in the ground uh, forever, and therefore, they have no market value because they can never be traded. So uh, sorry, those aren't, those may be stranded assets, but they're uh, worthless assets. We will um, it will support your uh, employees uh, and, uh, and you know, have the, uh, the just transition and move them into renewable energy, et cetera. But um, yeah, we, it, we're not going to um, solve this problem by working with the same um, 
the same entities that got us into the problem in the beginning. Right, and you know, uh, someone mentioned in the chat earlier, and and we should we haven't really brought this up, but I, I don't think the conversation would be complete without really identifying capitalism as the problem. And you yeah. you know you talked about it in terms of growth and the growth mindset, but yeah. essentially this drive for profits, which emphasizes profits over resource management and uh, safe resource yeah. management, is what's gotten us into this mess. But the leaders that have charged themselves, if you will, or yeah. we've charged through our votes with solving this problem and getting us out of this crisis, seem to think that a capitalist approach to solving the climate crisis is what's gonna work best, when it's very likely that that will work worst, <laughs> right? Yeah, right, yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's another example of expecting the same system that created this mess to get us out of it. And you know, we can have capitalism or we can have a livable planet, but you know, it, we can't have both. If we have, um, uh, and, um, and people say, oh, um, well, well you, know, you, you know, you can't start with, we're gonna get rid of capitalism. Well, fine, let's start with, if, we do what is necessary to um, solve the climate emergency, including getting rid of uh, uh, the burning of fossil fuels. Um, cap capitalism isn't a creature that can live in captivity and it, capitalism will wither uh, un under those kind of circumstances. Right. So we, we, we can't only, um, or restrict the uh, the extraction and use of fossil fuels. We have to um, build uh, movements and institutions that can um, can provision society and make sure that there is sufficiency for everybody and and that we, we and, and, uh, no waste and, and equity. And, and isn't this what uh, indigenous, uh, tr uh, what's called traditional uh, ecological knowledge or TEK is essentially yeah. based on that, you know, if, if if indigenous communities had a capitalist approach, they would have gone down the same path that post industrial and industrial yeah. um, uh, economies have gone, um, cannot really live in harmony with the earth or the capitalist mindset. And I'm trying to sort of reflect yeah. on some of the other questions that came um about here um, in the chat, the K. Schimberg says so many at all levels seem unwilling to consider seriously conserving, cutting back on overuse and waste of all kinds of resources. We could use a lot more minimalist values and actions that most of us want to proceed with. Another person I can't remember who uh, mentioned something about um, the buy nothing revolution and, and how that needs to kind of be more um, and the sharing mm -hmm. economy needs to be uh, promoted and publicized more. <laughs> Yeah, in uh, I guess around February of uh, 2020, when I was um, writing the uh, kind of doing the final work on the Green New Deal and, and beyond, it was probably January. I um, was uh, writing about how um, you know, my dream was uh, a, a, an uh, air travel strike. You know, everybody. Um, you know, it, it, um, refusing to fly because you know flying is horrible and miserable anyway, and so uh, just um, uh, let, let's have a, a air travel strike. And then a few weeks later, ninety-five percent of the global uh, airline fleet was grounded because of the pandemic, and and, and the world didn't end. And, 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 but when I was writing that, I was thinking, oh yeah, right, like uh, that's going to happen. And, and, and then it happened. So um, it's, um, and, and obviously that hasn't uh, led to anything important, but in, in the book, I, um, I emphasize that an individual, action is very important and, and we 
you know, can't really claim to be um, you know, um, doing anything unless we're individually um, you know, re reforming the way we live. But at, at the same time, because you know, we, we've just got a decade, decade and a half to act that we really have to be pushing for uh, national action. And, and then um, it, it can't happen in just one country. So we need things like the uh, uh, non-proliferation treaty. We need things like national caps on fossil fuels. And at the local level, we need um, uh, um, more careful um, uh, um, stewardship of resources and and fairer sharing of resources and and a kind of deliberative democratic processes. So it, it's, it's kind of three different uh, levels that all have to be functioning. Um, well, I, it seems like we're almost out of time, Peter. Should I squeeze in one more question, or should I wrap up? Yeah, we could fit in one more. Okay. Um, all right. I, and I want to end with my with, with a quote uh, from Stan's book near the end. But but um, let me pull up uh, one question um, by Piyush uh, asking, "Hi, Stan. What would a global authority in charge of enforcing fossil fuel caps look like?" And that's a really good question because because we've run out of time. You're calling for stronger regulation, stronger sort of central power, which can also be scary for a lot of people, mm -hmm. uh, not to mention, you know, scary for the uh, easy to propagandize against by the right, but also scary mm -hmm. for those who worry about how the power in central hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it does seem like a, an outlandish idea that the, you know, the whole world could come together on uh, something like this. but what, what the uh, the people talking about the um, uh, treaty are saying is that um, they um, that there might be um, groups of countries, that, um, uh, alliances, or what they call clubs of of countries who agree. Okay, we'll we'll all hold hands and jump in into the pool together and. Um, and, and this has to be the uh, affluent, high emitting countries. Um, uh, Y'all may have seen the, um, the graphic that uh, came out of uh, Oxfam. It look, looks like a, a martini glass, I guess, but it, it shows that 50% like of the emissions come from 10% uh, of the world's population. And so, um, yeah, the, the countries who are not big emitters have a, have, have a longer time to um, uh, do this, but the big emitting countries, if, if they can um, start um, you know, getting together in, in twos and threes or fours and fives, um, and I know I'm, I'm uh, probably quite naive in, in thinking this, but um, yeah. We we we, you know, we have to uh, you know, we have to have something to aim for, and the the you know the current uh, COP uh, structure is it, it, you know, if it didn't happen if it doesn't happen this time then when you know John Kerry was saying it's now or never you know all the people are saying if we don't do it now um, you know, it, 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 then we're you know, then we're defeated. I, I don't think that's true because every uh, every tenth of a degree of warming that we prevent is going to prevent um, more uh, ecological and humanitarian uh, disasters. So yeah, we can't say it's now or never, but I think we can say maybe it's now or never for this uh, COP system and that, that we that nations need to uh, go another way. So, uh, Piyush, I, I don't have a very good answer to your question, but um, there, there are ways we, 
that it could be done if, if the will is there. Well, one of the things that we can all do is uh, subscribe to Yes, get a copy of um, Stan's mm -hmm. book, Through City Lights. Um, and I want to just end by reading a quote from the very end of Stan's book that encompasses the urgency that we face today. He writes, quote, racial justice and reparations can't wait. Ecological restoration can't wait. Nor can workers' rights, a just food system, or universal health care. We can no longer wait to cut off fossil fuels at the source. So many years have been lost that it's far from certain that we can turn off the tap in time to prevent calamity. The sooner we do, however, the larger the share of the earth that will remain habitable, not just for humans, but for the web of life of which we are all but one small part. Stan, Stan, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our audience for joining us. Thank you to City Lights as well. Thank you, Sanhala.